Hello, everyone. So happy to see you um, for this session of Portland Cocktail Week, History of Gathering, a guided tour of contemporary and indigenous flavors. My name is Eddie Hansel. I'm hosting today's session. I'm the operations manager for the Campari Academy, um, coming to you live from Brooklyn right now. Uh, and today's session is sponsored by Wild Turkey. Uh, we're just going to jump right into it. I'm so pleased to introduce my great friend, Chucky Tom. I've had the pleasure of enjoying her personality and her delicious cocktails, as well as her Doom Tiki pop-up here in New York. Um, she's coming to us from the UK now, and I'll let us introduce our guest for today, and we'll take it from there. I'm really excited to learn along with everyone, so I'll pass it off to Chucky. Thanks so much, Eddie. Always great to see you. Um, hi, I am Chucky Tom. I am Pomo from California and Walker River Paiute from Nevada. As Eddie mentioned, I am the co-founder of Doom Tiki, which is a non-appropriative, tropical, immersive fundraising pop-up that likes to collaborate and raise funds for different communities dealing with the after effects of colonization. And I'm an, indiz an indigenous visibility advocate. And joining me today is Brian Yazzie. Today, he will lead us through the history and context of contemporary indigenous flavors. As owner of Intertribal Food Waste, Chef Yazi is on a culinary mission to work with and for the betterment of tribal communities through food sovereignty. So thank you for joining us today, Chef. Thank you for having me. And um, just to help everybody uh, get a little up to date, can you explain to us a little bit about what food sovereignty is? Food sovereignty is basically, you know, for me, from my perspective, uh, you know, the journey I have been with indigenous food, to me, food sovereignty is um, you know, getting back to your edible landscape, right? R regardless you know, who we are, we're all indigenous to a certain place and time. And only a handful of us are able to have access to our cultural food, right? For example, you know, whatever lake or, um, or um, you know, stream or river that you live, that's in your backyard, right? You can take one mile walk, you know, you can get all these edible ingredients that you need. It can be small game, it can be a large game animal, it can be edible plants, right? Um, it can be um, the, the food relatives that are in the river, that are in the lake, right? So whatever that's in that area is definitely, you know, returning back to your edible landscape. To me, that's food sovereignty, sustainability, and knowing the difference between climate change, you know, and what, what was happening here before. Yeah, I mean, food is very important to, like, my community as well. We're actually named after the trout that we eat. So, you know, um, when you say food relatives, can you explain a little bit more about that concept? Yeah, so food relatives is a term that's recently um, started being, you know, being used in the, especially in the indigenous food movement, right? And I use that a lot because uh, I do work with game, I do work with meat, I do work with protein, right? And I have families and friends, relatives, you know, uh, foodies in, uh, who are vegan, who are vegetarian, right? But then there's that disconnection of understanding our food weight, especially with the community who may be vegan or vegetarian, right? And, and looking at the, our plant relatives in different ways. Right? For example, I have one of the native uh, sacred ingredient here is sweetgrass, right? It's for ceremonial use, but then if you use it appropriately, you know, you can also use it as a, as a culinary spice or herb, right? And I'll touch more on that. You know, it's just knowing our, again, knowing our edible landscape, right? We have plant relatives that we depend on, especially the plains tribe here, here in the Midwest, and the blueberry is one of the good berries here in the area. Right, and, and knowing the sustainability behind the climate change, right, and understanding that just like our, our animal relatives, these plants are, are, are the living species as well, right, from the plant they start rooting to the, to the um, time they're, they're being harvested, right, so they, and then once they, once they enter your kitchen, once they go into your, your, um, your freezer or your, um, your walk-in, right, they, they still have that living entity in them as well, you know, so it's just, it's just touching faces on that. And knowing that, you know, we're plant relatives, when I say that, it's just knowing that these are living beings that we depend on as well in a full cycle. I think that also leads to a lot, uh, a very, like, healthier relationship with food, too, just kind of having, like, a bigger understanding and being part of, like, you know, a bigger thing than just ourselves. So how did your journey with food start? Um, how do I start my journey in, um, in food? Um, well, to take a step back, I um, started cooking at the age of seven, right? Um, I'm the youngest out of eight siblings. Um, 
my mom basically the unconditional love is um my mom and my dad for me growing up right my dad passed away from heart failure when i was five years old right so two years later you know the age of seven it's just you know i always did what i could to help my mom knowing that that the older men or the, or the older guys in the family had moved out you know living out on their own right so my, my mom you know, back then we lived on the um or the school campus now no now um community school so then hosted arizona northeast part of the navigation you know so at the age of seven this is my found my, my passion for cooking but it, it was through unconditional love that my mom showed me you know, i wanted to find ways to get back you know because you know, most of the time growing up she worked she worked um, at least 12, 18 hour shift, right? She worked a double shift. Um, watching the um, the kids on campus, you know, who lived out in the backwoods. Um, so she would come home, regardless what time of day it was, if it was in the morning, afternoon, or late at night, she always prepared a hot meal for us, right? So that way we had meals throughout the day, we can reheat instead of, um, instead of looking at junk food or ramen and stuff like that. You know, so the love that she showed me for food, that was my way of giving back to my mom in the beginning. And then accidentally I found my passion for cooking while I was helping my mom. Right. So at the age of seven, I remember um my mom came home. Um, I was watching the original pork oil, right? The original in the early nineteen nineties. And um she came home, instead of coming home to relax, she went straight into the kitchen and she was making some type of beef stew. And I remember she used some um wild spinach and my aunt gave her um or lamb sports. Right, and some wild onions and wild carrots as well that grows in the southwest area. You know, she added some russet potatoes and, um, and some other herbs and spices. You know, but the aromatics is coming from the kitchen and the knife tapping on the cutting board. That's basically what the curiosity of that brought me to the kitchen one day. You know, and ever since then, I just had a passion for food. That's a beautiful story. I've my um, love of food started because our family had a fried bread booth at all the powwows in Los Angeles when I was little. And as I've gotten older, I, I mean, I still like it on occasion, but I've definitely found myself, especially, you know, when you get older and you're like worried about your health, definitely doing a lot more research about what we actually ate. And it's definitely made a difference. And even now, even though I'm in Europe, finding some of those ingredients or bringing them with me always makes me feel like I'm home, I find. Yeah. So tell us a little bit more about the work that you're doing and where you're at and yeah. So and also, um, could you explain to to our viewers um, what intertribal means? Yeah. Um, so for me, you know how I got into um, into cooking, you know how I got to careers. Basically, you know um, when I was in a, in boarding school, um, elementary, grade school to high school, right? I I, I took a, a, a different turn, or just a touch base on that. Um, you know having a without a father figure in the household, right? My mom can only do so much in bringing me up, right? So um, I started, um, I went to four different high schools on the reservation and in Phoenix, Arizona, right? And I went through all four detention centers on the reservation. So I, I left the reservation at 11 or 12 years old and I moved to Phoenix, Arizona. And to me, that was a cultural shock, right? And I got introduced to gang activities and stuff like that. I, I took on that lifestyle from um, my early teen years to my early um, um, about 21, 22 is when I kind of stopped that, that 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 type of lifestyle. You know, so I remember, um, you know, um, going to high school in Phoenix, Arizona, and and, and, I, and I found that you know that term philosophy that couldn't save my life. And the reason for that is I'll be gone for days at a time from home, right? And my, and my sisters, my siblings, would give me a call. You know, we 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 miss your food. You know, we miss your cooking. And that was their way of checking on me, right? And I, I, this was before prep meals and everything was popular. So I, I would make food and I would put them in Ziploc bags and freeze them so they can just reheat that as well on the way to work or whatever, you know? So and then growing up, you know, I, I was um, getting getting stabbed, getting shot at, I mean, that type of lifestyle. So um, um, stealing cars, shop shops, uh, stealing car stereos, right? So that was the lifestyle I was brought up in. And, Unfortunately, you know, I helped brought that back to my community on the navigation as well. You know, so I had the next generation doing similar to what I was doing. I was growing up in that lifestyle. And I, I ended up going to uh, Timberlake Job Court, which is um, in Cicada, Oregon, just an hour east of Portland, Oregon, right up, up in Mount Hood. 
So I, I went there for about almost a year and a half. You know, um, I wanted to get away from the lifestyle I live. I wanted to try something new. So I ended up going to job for And I went to the culinary program. And I was there for it. So it was a two-year program. I, I did about two semesters, and I was homesick. Right, a guy um, living in the Reds, never leaving Arizona, right? And I was homesick, mainly about my mom. I was seeing a parent. I wanted to see how she was doing, right? And I, I was halfway through my semester. I was doing everything good. So, and I ended up leaving. Uh, we did about a summer break, a two-week break, and I ended up just, just staying home, right? So just seeing how my mom was struggling with work and how she wants to go into retirement, but she still has to work and you know, feed herself, stuff like that. So I ended up taking odd jobs. I was working in a lot of um, um, kitchens, a lot of Asian restaurants. Uh, for me, I love outdoor cooking, making healthy plans. So I was working as a for Asian restaurants. And uh, I worked at a couple of Jack in the Box late at night. And uh, and ended up meeting my wife in Phoenix, Arizona, um, 2000, 2008, 2009, right when I came back from from, uh, from um, job work. And, when I met her, you know, she gave me the ultimatum you know, to, to be in a serious relationship or to continue what I'm doing, right? And she seen the potential of me with cooking and, and catering and stuff like that. You know, so she encouraged me, right? You need, you need to stop the BS or, or, you know, you can be on your own. So with the ultimatum, I was able to sit down with her and see how we could move forward as a couple, right? So, and, and again, I was drawn back to that lifestyle, but I wanted to get away from that. So we moved back to the Napa Nation for a short period of time in 2000, 2010 to 2011, the end of 2011. And I started doing a lot of um, odd work, rock busting, carpentry, uh, labor rating work. And well, the money was good, but it wasn't a passion that I had with this picture. And I, we ended up moving to Shakopee, Minnesota, just south of the cities um, in 2012. You know, we're, we moved here. Everything was like, we didn't know who was here. We said, um, my, my wife's uh, brother, who was married to a Minnesota lady, and um, we end up, you know, getting introduced to the Midwest culture, you know, the, the Dakotas and Chipways, and and actually where I'm at now was the first place I had a wild rice in a long life, right? And I didn't know what it was. It was a family family elder that brought us a plate. Like, hey, here's some wild rice, here's some wild rice. And I know you guys are from Arizona. Here's some hot sauce, <laughs> you know, and um. And it, it was plain wild rice, right? It was plain. It was, it was just a, a fried um, walleye. It was good to me. That was the introduction to the food culture of the Midwest, right? And um, and 2013, my wife, she wanted to go back to school. She knew what she wanted to do, right? So go to school for an RN. For me, I still wasn't sure. And she encouraged me to, to look into college school, right? And she said, why don't you just get paid for something you'd love to do? That makes more sense. Instead of living paycheck to paycheck, so, all right, well, let, let me look at the St. Paul College and I'll look into the court on blue, but the court on blue, but still open here in you know, Wilmington, right? And I compared it to tuition costs, I compared it to academic level, and I ended up going with St. Paul College because it was, not only was it half the price, but it had more challenging capstones, a, a lot of academic, and a lot of local networks with restaurants and um, communities where you can do internship programs. So I ended up going with St. Paul College. And, when I did, you know, uh, I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do as, as a career wise. I still had my passion for cooking, but it wasn't until the first semester I, uh, I got a passion for uh, um, a task for indigenous food, right? And it, it was accident as well. So I was looking at these different cookbooks across the world. You know, a couple of my peers came up with a challenge for the first semester it was to pick one dish from any cuisine across the world. And if you try to perfect that dish, then we'll get some points from our instructor in the middle of the semester, and we'll get some credits. And so, you no, know, I was hyped about it, but I still wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was looking at Southern food ways cooking. I'm looking at um, Japanese cuisine. I was looking at um, Mexican, um, South America uh, food culture, right? Um, underground cooking, just like my tribe Navajo's Southwest food underground fire pit cooking. I was looking at those, those type of um, um, cuisine, and the things I kept seeing were um, corn, beans, and squash. Right? I kept seeing these different tomatoes and chilies and these different cuisines. And, and just knowing the fundamentals of cooking, knowing that these are ingredients that are coming from the Americas, right? So, and that blew my mind. Okay, let, let me go go with look for a native cookbook. You know, and there was no cookbooks out around that time. But, and there was a lot of um, Indian talkers and vibrant advertisements for people on YouTube. So I just had to, you know, break that down myself and look at my food culture and the Southwest food culture. They compare the different 
from the big list, the code is not simply from policy, right? And just, and just looking at the difference of that, and while I was in culinary school, and I came up with the term intertribal food waste, and that was before it became a cable before it became the brand, you know, and um, I just came up with that um, philosophy because coming from the Southwest and being able to work with um, indigenous food policy in the Midwest, you know, came up with intertribal, just working with different um, tribal um, um, ingredients and, and food cultures. So I came up with that term. And around the same time, uh, I ended up, um, my wife and I started the Native American Club on campus. Um, all Nations Student Association just to bring more um, acknowledgement and representation to the Native population, even though we're less than 2% on campus out of 2,700 students, right? And um, our, our first event, it was Why Treaties Matter in the Midwest. And we're looking for a Native caterer, someone besides doing Indian South and the private right here, right? Because we're talking about the Midwest treaties, and we wanted to be appropriate to that type of event. And my wife um, found um, guy named Sean Sherman, now known as the sous chef on social media, right? And um, we ended up contacting him. He provided um, an appetizer for our event. And I remember looking at the ingredients. I did not know about 80% of what the ingredients were. Most of them were forage. Most of them were preserved. You know, but, um, most of them were, were um, processed ingredients, right? And also travel source. So I didn't know what they were, different type of wild game, different type of plants, right? Different um, varieties of mushrooms. And um, at the end of the night, we found out I was a culinary student. So basically, you know, I needed 250 hours before I graduated. And, and that same night, you know, he invited me to work with the team that needed hours. And, and he's seen the potential of me. And um, that night at campus, we walked off campus after the event, walked across the street to the Minnesota Historical Society. And he had an event there going on that same night. So I ended up helping him, being on the line, serving out just to get the lingo down of what these ingredients are. And ever since then, you know, I've just been working with him from 2014 to the year I graduated, 2016, you know. And when I did, you know, he, he gave me the ultimatum, you know, the blessing to, to, to continue working with him and to, to start a whole crew and help him build the brand or else to branch out on my own because he sees potential in me, right? So I had a good following on social media while I was on that studio. And I started doing some work on my own as well. So with the blessing, I was able to branch out on my own. And my wife and I started um, the um, travel food race came in. And since 2016, we, we travel internationally. And we're also um, um, delegates of Slow Food um, USA and Slow Food um, Federal Island Association. And also, um, the, I'm a member of I Collective, which is a group of um, um, cooks, chefs, seed keepers, uh, food activists, food scholars from South America to Canada and Alaska, and you know, we're all different tribal individuals. And we, we talk about the culinary and cultural appropriation of the kitchen. Right, basically more than calling out people, but trying to start a dialogue and try to help bring awareness to what our indigenous food culture is, instead of looking at it as something you can romanticize around. Right, so that's more of a serious uh, group and, and approach that I've worked with as well. And so, yeah, so that was 16 when I graduated and I started my, uh, my catering company. And basically, you know, it just took off from there, you know. But when I did that, you know, I was focusing on decolonized menu when everything was decolonized, and 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 I hit the ground running. It, it was a good momentum, but then I realized after a while, most of our travel community was still in a third world poverty status. Meaning, I may have squash, I may have corn, I may have salmon, you know, I may have wild rice. These are ingredients, so these are some ingredients that are indigenous to America, but not every tribal community have access to these type of ingredients, especially if they are heirloom ingredients, right? So it's basically going to your local co-op and paying triple the price, right? So I have to listen to my elders, my communities, and I have to take a step back from doing fully deep on this menu. So I started doing 75% indigenous ingredients and 25% organic ingredients, you know, and that's the same philosophy that we started here at the cafe I think it's really interesting that a lot of people like to talk about how American cuisine is a melting pot, but they always seem to leave out the indigenous foods as American cuisine. Like, you know, that's what we were doing pre-invasion. And I just really like now that there's, that we're finally being in the conversation that we've been trying to have for over like what, 500 years now, I think it is. 
Um, could you explain just a little bit more too, just about how um, valuable the role of the elders are in our community? Just, you know, I know a lot of people read about it, but I always feel like explaining it from one of us is just the best way to get that understanding. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for our this program, we started um, right when the pandemic hit, right? So for me, I was, a, I was a traveling chef and a caterer, you know, all my business were halt when the pandemic hit, you know, and I wasn't worried about, you know, um, how can I stay sustainable or naturally? Because in 2016, I started my YouTube channel, Yazzie Chef TV, and that's when I realized that a lot of travel communities cannot bring a chef or a cook out, right? on the lack of funds. So I ended up using this channel as, as a tool where I can share easy made recipes, five to seven minute videos and the travel presentations. So I started focusing on that as a tool to, to help give back to the community, the ones that are unable to bring a chef or a cook out, right? So I already had that virtual cooking and teaching down before the pandemic. And when it hit, I was able to use my tools and do cooking classes, virtual teaching, Right. And but I want to do something more to, to continue helping the community, right? Because that's always been my, my home base, community base. So I reached out to a friend of mine, Ben Shindu, who's a Tiwa and in, um in, in, in from um uh, southern um New Mexico, just south of Albuquerque. And um I reached out to him, he was working here at the time. And I and I asked, you know, what um are you guys do you guys need help on the line? Do you guys need help serving Food? Are you guys still open to the public? Um, you guys have a project to feed anyone in the community? Um, I have nothing to do right now. I would like to help. I'm not self quarantine for 14 days. You know, I need to get out the house. You know, I want to help where I can, or even if I can do mutual aid network social media. You know, so he ended up telling me that they, they did, um, they are still open to the public, but they're planning to close because they received a small grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield, Minnesota to start a project for feeding the community. Right, but he didn't know where to start of what type of community, you know, what demographic. So we had a meeting. I remember this on um, March 22nd. We had a meeting beginning of the pandemic. And we talked with the building director here, Mary Lavard, and we talked about um, what demographic, what should we focus on. We started talking about feeding the elders, the native elders, and then feeding the unsheltered houses, right? And um, two days later, March 24th, is when we started the program. And we emptied everything out from the uh, from the freezer, the walk-in, uh, the salad bar, the dry storage, everything. Once in a week and a half, we just cleaned everything out before we brought more, um, um, more inventory in. So we hit the ground running. We, uh, we didn't expect that. We started feeding about five to 800 meals a day, five days a week when we first started. We had about a volunteer group of probably eight that we have here, but the core team were about four of us, right? And we started this program and in June or July of that year, we uh, our funds were, were getting low from Blue Cross Blue Shield. So, and I, I was trying to find ways, you know, we have community donating ingredients, but it wasn't enough people who were pushing out. So I ended up reaching out to a friend of mine, Nate Luke, who's the, um, the right-hand man to Jose Andreas and uh, World Central Kitchen. You know, I, I met Nate Luke in 2017 at the Mad Six Symposium in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark, uh, at the NOMA um, event. And I met him and I attended his workshop with World Central Kitchen, you know, how they how they support communities who are going through um, natural disaster, right? So, and I, I seen a blueprint he did how to start an organization or a grassroots foundation, right? So I used that and I was using that, you know, then I, when I reached out to him, I asked, you know, do you guys, provide support to cafes and restaurants, you know, especially with indigenous communities. You know, we uh, were looking for sponsorship and, you know, we got a phone call and two days later, they end up supporting us full time, even to this day now, you know, so they, we get reimbursed with the meals that we push out, right? So, and, and that helped us a lot. So, and this year we slowed down in the summertime and we started doing at least 200 meals um, a day, and then we started going to two days a week, you know, because we're losing some of our volunteers, so going to kind of wages to different um, uh, fine dining or whatever, right? And, uh, and that's understandable, you know. So we, we narrowed down our staff, so we narrowed down the delivery times to two days a week. And right now, we just started last week again, we took a couple months break. So we just started back up, and now we're doing 150 meals twice a day, 
And uh, we have more elements that are showing up right now, probably at one seventy five today, right? So, and uh, the reason for focusing on elders and shepherd relatives was, uh, you know, reflecting on my mom growing up, right? How to this day she needs help, you know, she needs care, you know, and just knowing that there's a lot of our um, tribal community members who are elders in urban spaces that also need help, regardless if they're living near a bus stop or transportation, right? And this year in pandemic, you know, their, their immune system are compromised, right? So they're unable to travel on their own, you know, without catching the flu or without catching the COVID. The, the, the COVID. So uh, they started um, hiring you know, volunteer drivers and started pushing out meals to the elders. You know, we got uh, positive feedback, you know, but we do have a diverse kind of community. So what I mean by that is uh, there might be some elders or tribes who don't eat seafood. It might be how there is the only place, right, due to ceremonial practices or or their indigenous given name. For example, my wife is um her her um indigenous name is Unmana. Even though she's Apache now from Tan, um her godparents are Hopi, so they gave her a Hopi name, which is uh, Unmana, and that means bear girl, bear girl in Hopi, right? So for me as a cooker chef. Uh, I, I can't touch or eat or do anything with bear meat or bear grease or bear products, right? And that's just out of respect for my wife, right? So just learning those protocols and learning which elder gets what type of food, right? And it's a small community, so you get a phone call, right, from the elder in the back. Oh, uh, I'm not supposed to eat bison, but I'll serve bison, right? So, okay, so they write down specifically what they can and have, you know? So, and... And um, especially a lot of um, tribal um, nursing homes here in the cities that, that we support, you know. And again, if it's just um, providing traditional and healthy ingredients to our elders, right? So we, we, we do flavor food, you know, but then within the last year, we have to slow down on using so much seasoning because a lot of our elders are saying that all they want is salt and pepper on the food, right? And <laughs> if you're a cook or a chef, it's like your heart is broken. It's like, I'm, I'm trying to create a meal. That, that's delicious, but at the same time, when you're working with community, you, you got to respect the elders, right? It, it's not about you, it's not about self ego, you no, know, it's not about creativity, it's about the, the demographic of being, it's about their palate, right? It's about how colonized uh, their, their, their palace have been, right? With commodity food program in the early 1800s, right? And then it was like the story about how you process ingredients, so they're, they're, they're unable to, uh, some of them unable to, to enjoy food. Um, food that we would play with, depending if it's a lot of sodium or a lot of sugar, right? So just just covering those type of topics is uh, something that we learned throughout the year, and and not not just that, but learning what type of raw food we use. For example, here in the, in the kitchen, we don't have white white sugar or, or um, uh, highly processed sugar, so we use a lot of maple syrup, a lot of agave, a lot of um, honey, so we travel source honey, and um, a lot of bird syrup. Right. And even if we're um, cooking down on a sweet farm, right, we, 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 we reduce the uh, liquid and we turn that to the syrup, right? So just using a lot of byproducts like that and trying not to have all food go to waste and try to use everything as much as we can. Amazing. We actually had uh, Sean on last week, so it's really nice to have um, you uh, coming next just to kind of put the whole picture together of the work that both of you guys are yeah, doing. There's one thing that Sean said, right, from... I don't know if we shared it with you guys, but the first night I ever worked with him, one thing he shared with me is that, you know, you can go in any city across the world, right? You can get any type of food within one block radius, right? But what you can't get is the original food from that land, right? And and that stuck with me, you know, when I was a culinary student, so, okay, I'm going to focus on that, right? So, and then from there, it's just expired me. Now, right now, there's, there's a good handful of cooks and chefs out there that you can definitely network with, right? And then there's also a website out there where you can click on the map and find travel food resources from that area, or you can purchase, you know, from travel resources. So it's pretty cool to see the movement growing. But again, for me, what the philosophy is cutting back on decolonized menu. And the reason why I did that, I shared, but I would say five to seven years from now, it would, it would be a good start to start, you know, providing restaurants to we fully decolonized menu. And the reason for that is if we all have restaurants that are decolonized menu, the women are family free, we're going to exhaust the travel resources in the years, right? And, and not just that, it's going to ripple effect 
the actual average tribal community that lived on that land who did not have access to their own um, food ingredients. For example, quinoa, you know, coming from South America, Central America, you know, um, it's very expensive. It's you know, right now known as a power food, right? But at the same time, the tribal community who, who are um, harvesting these and processing these, they don't have access to their own to their own food culture, right? So it, it's just learning the balance of sustainability in the carbon footprint and the time that. So basically, that, that is the, uh, the focus that, that I'm doing now. And like I said, five to seven years from now, we'll definitely see a lot of tribal farms. Um, right now, you see a trend of victory gardens, right? So you see a lot of urban spaces that are turning um, the landscape into gardens and stuff. So I, I think that that would be great. Um, one thing I want to touch on, I'm talking about farming, is we just did our first um, cultivation plot at Little Ur Urban Farm just south of Minneapolis here. And it's a tribal food farm. It's, everything's organic, non GMO, but it's more of a commercialized seed that we found. So 25% of the plot is, is a cafe plot. So we use original heirloom seeds, original heirloom ingredients, right? None, no seeds that you can purchase from seed saving website or nothing that you can find at Walmart or Target, right? Or in a farm stores. Like all these ingredients were actual the, the mother seeds, right? So we had blue hover, we had a get a crucian, we had um we had healthy black beans, turtle beans, we had um the Navajo and the saucy beans, we had um uh, what else we had a night of white corn, you know, so we have two two types of corn. And once in a harvest season we lost eighty percent of our of our harvest. And we found out because you know this year a lot of farms got hit with squash bug with Japanese bugs. Right, so we got hit with that, and realizing that our our plot throughout the whole farm is the only plot that is actually indigenous. So, you no, know, so looking at the bugs and looking at the food they want, they got our food is more attractive to these bugs, right? So we got hit hard, and we lost at least eighty percent of the crops, and that that was just a learning a learning curve for us, you know, how we how we can move forward next year, you know. So just talking about you know those type of ancestral ingredients and learning how to preserve and harvest them is, I would say, about five to seven years. That's a really amazing project. And I really liked hearing all the stories about, you know, I th or um, what's the best way to put it? I think just learning about just um, what different elders require and things too is just like another way to preserve more tradition and just learn things. Like one yeah. of my favorite things always um, when we were traveling, especially when we were kids, was visiting other nations, learning about different foods, uh, getting foods from people's grandmothers, learning the different stories and stuff like that. And I was, um, I mentioned this last week, but I think um, during Standing Rock, that was one of the biggest times that I can remember that so many people were gathered together and sharing so many different foods. And I think that was one of the more beautiful things that came out of that whole situation. But um, can you tell us a little bit about what you're gonna make for us today? Yeah. Yeah, um, before I touch on that, I just want to thank Sorry to here for a second. Um, one thing I want to share with you guys, uh, we'll bring up standing rock. Uh, my wife and I, you know, were in culinary school, you know, working, working with Sean. I know the same year I graduated, 12, 16. Um, as a culinary student, you know, I wanted to do something to help, you know, the community up there as well, right? And seeing so many travel members coming up helping and for me it wasn't about self-recognition or or you know using my platform in negative way so i reached out to a lot of chef friends and connections i had and said you know i'm gonna be doing some trips to stand about anyone who's interested can donate one personal food dried ingredients you know if it's maple in, in a gallon jar um uh, sweeteners whatever it is uh clothing camping supplies you know so my wife and i talk you know, and bring a 15 foot meal you know, truck you know, and we had some money that we saved too throughout the semester. And the, the response was amazing. Um, we we were shocked about the restaurant. You know, we were working out of the church in, in Uptown, in Minneapolis, just west of Minneapolis. And when we set up shop, we had the local news show up, you know, we did everything the media presence. And we had so much support from the community. We actually upgraded our 15 foot meal you know, to 27 foot meal you know, truck. Right, and had the local um, organic um, consumer association just here in Minneapolis. Um, the, the, the lady, um, uh, John Turkin, you know, he's an ally, non-native ally, who support us, and 
if you had connection with the local, uh, the main distributor for the local co-ops, right? So co-op partners warehouse, so they're able to connect with us and then they match the funding. So they're able to provide uh, $10,000 from, from their uh, warehouse where they sell so and, and that was amazing. So we ended up doing two trips so, um, with that same year. And for me, I wasn't able to actually go to the front line, right? And my reason for that was I seen that my front line was the kitchen because I was getting two weeks on two different trips to take over the main kitchen. You know, back then they had eight to eight to ten kitchens in different areas, but the main kitchen is where I worked at, right? And um, we had meals coming in between the days and um, I had a whole group of um, indigenous groups, mainly women, who were able to help me in, in the kitchen. And we're making fresh uh, Navajo salad tortillas, and we're using gluten, and we're using dairy, but at the same time, like a local bison farm, we're able to provide some bison. Right? And, and for me, popping out with that was not just using my platform, but it was a way to help bring awareness to our, to our indigenous um, um, landscape. And to help freshness or put out um, relatives, right? That was my reason, main reason why, because it's not it's not if but when the pipeline breaks, right? So, you know, looking at Standing Rock, you know, I was looking at the um, tribal communities and the farmlands that are downriver, right? And it would affect not just the community, but also affect our, our friend relatives and animal relatives. Right? So that was my main reason of going there and just having that support. From my community and from my wife, right? And the one thing I'll never forget is a lady, a Pomo lady. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's really the coastal food culture or not, but a Pomo lady showed up with 150 pounds of filet shark steaks, right? From California, I was like, wait, uh, and can can we serve this? You know, and so we ended up going to the main fire, right? And started talking with an elder who was from Sandy Rock, and I asked, you know, would I be can I serve this or can I just freeze it and give it to someone else who would eat it. You know, and he was telling me, you know what, look around, there are so many tribal nations. We all have different uh, corn culture, different squash culture. We have different food that we call our own. You know, and he said, I don't see a problem with you putting down the menu, right? So we end up doing um, shark tacos with venison and bison tacos that night, right? And it, 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 was, it was a hit. We had a two hour line with so many people were in line, right? And it, it was great, especially during the Thanksgiving. Right, during the holidays, we, you know, we had uh, Winona LaDuke and um, and um, a couple of celebrities that came, but they were at City Bowl College, you know, presenting a fine dining type experience, right? And n nothing negative about them, but I kind of felt like I got to stay here in the camp and help with the nine kitchens. We can create an 18 foot table and provide meals for those who weren't able to go to attend the, the experience at the college. So we end up doing that. We had about a 22. Um, eight foot tables lined up in the big dome, you know, and we're right in the center of the of the camp. Um, and and, uh, and all these five kitchens brought their own type of tribal food, regardless what it was. But the allies were doing vegan and vegetarian meals. But it was beautiful. We had line out the door for four hours, right? We had so many people um, getting food, getting seconds, and getting you know whatever it was. And that's one of the experiences I'll never forget, right? During Thanksgiving, during the holiday, you know, flipping that strip of of what it means serving indigenous food, what it means to fight for our, our existence, right? So um, just a little story on that. You know, it's Sandy Rock is fun. They are. It's been a journey. You know, every time that story comes up, it's just, you know, it gets me emotion. It gets me emotional sometimes because, you know, just being there during that time, you know, it's hard to explain to people because it has to be present to understand how things are going especially when you're pulling into the gate and the security is like walking home, right? Then you, the, the smoke and different travel nation flags going down when you're driving to your camp, right? So it was just, it felt good. Right? It's just, it's very um, I've, heard, um, I've heard that story, but it's, I have, it's hearing it from your perspective was beautiful. And you know, what's really funny, Um, you know, our, our Pomo side, there's certain food things that um, we've learned about. And then when I, when I've um, connected with other coastal people from like New Zealand and Hawaii, it's kind of interesting that there are some like food similarities and a, and a, and a big love of abalone wearing and eating. So what do you, what are you working on now? Is that um, the salmon? So for the menu today, this is one of the, um, 
the dishes that we had on our menu for, for a short while. So I'm making a um, this, uh, maple and sage lay salmon. And uh, it'll be salad. So for a salad, we have uh, blueberries. We have uh, pomegranate. We have um, fresh cook uh, red white nation wild rice. You know, if you're, if you're interested in wild rice or not, you know, they'll have knowledge of it. There's two types of wild rice. You know, there's farm wild rice and hand harvest, right? If you're looking for wild rice, you know, avoid looking at the package saying um, Canada or saying uh, Florida or California, right? You're looking at the Midwest and, and Central Canada area for as wild rice, right? So always look at tribal sports wild rice. And when you're cooking that, the lighter, the lighter color wild rice cooks faster. Right, and the darker wild rice, it takes longer. Right, so what I do is I, I just, just like you're doing the white rice, um, I, I bring it to a boil, I shut it off, and just let it sit for 10 to 15 minutes, and that way you can, you can fluff it with the pork. So if you're doing the um, dark rice, it's gonna keep it on boil the whole time until it's completely done. And so then we have some quinoa here, tricolor quinoa. And I um, also have some, um, some goat cheese here as well. So what's uh, your favorite wild rice? Do you like the lighter one or the darker one? I like the lighter color wild rice. And I like my wild rice from Net Lake. Net Lake is just northwest of Duluth, Minnesota, just right when you get to Canada. You know, so for me, I like the wild rice. It's just a different flavor, and you know, and just moving here too. You know, just learning that uh, from the 1940s and 1960s, there was a lot of um, war on wild rice and lakes of indigenous and non-indigenous families and communities, you know, who were going to war about where, where they could fish, right, or, or where they could harvest wild rice, right? And when that happened, a lot of the wild rice beds were destroyed, right? And with non-native uh, fish or whatever that's going into the lake, or oil or people destroyed the lake, man-made destroyed the lake. And um, for example, in the lakes, and Bad rivers in Wisconsin, the lakes is here, sort of, um, north of Minneapolis, north of uh, Minnesota, and they have the same two wild rice. And the reason for that is the um, the Malax, um had wild rice, and the Bad River Nation, um, they their their beds were destroyed, right? So they had, they were trying to find ways to reintroduce wild rice, so they end up connecting with um with um Malax Ben um community. And somehow they're able to transplant wild rice into Wisconsin. And now uh, Red Lake River has abundance of wild rice that came back to the But then again, you have line three going for that same wild rice bed, you know, and it'll, it'll, it'll be affected by it again. You know, so, um, yeah, so I would say Net Lake wild rice is my favorite. And we have some uh, maple syrup here for the uh, doing the dressing. Uh, we have some apple um, cider vinegar, uh, tribal source. We have some uh, seasoning here, um, sage, uh, paprika, and onions. This is what I'll be using for the um, salmon here. Then we have some arugula, watercress, and spinach from the local co-op. And uh, the main thing for the dressing is um, sweet grass. So what I'll be doing is I'll be blending up the maple syrup, some uh, sunflower oil, uh, garlic, onions, and a bit of the, um, the sage powder. And once that blends up, I'm going to light up the sweet grass, and I'm going to um, smoke the... Uh, the, the, the liquid, you know, so that way it gets some flavor. You can definitely add the sweet grass to the blender and strain it out, but then it has like a really strong aftertaste, which I love, but I found out the Elvis don't really like that strong flavor. So what I end up doing is smoking the, the liquid, you know, and then mixing that up again. So it, it's a really good light flavor from the sweet grass. Oh, well, um, one question too. Uh, uh, just to clarify, because I've come across this before, but what kind of sage are you using? What kind of what? What kind of sage do you use? Because every time I mention using sage, people always assume that it's white sage, and I don't use yeah. it for... Yeah, um, besides using the culinary sage, I like to use um, Himalayan sage. Um, it's called Himalayan sage. It's a really traditional sage. Um, I'm gonna flip my cutting board over here. Um, with traditional sage, you know, for using compared to culinary sage, um, the ratio would be one to three. So, for using culinary sage, you know, you can use the abundance you want, right? But for using traditional prairie sage, you have to cut that in half, 
right? So for, if you need about half a cup of culinary sage, you probably use about less than one fourth cup of the um, of the prairie sage. You know, that's what we have here. You know, it, it's it's um, dehydrated and and grinded up into powder. You know, and there's a really big difference. It's kind of like um, um, fibric. It's a lot of um, um, clumps in it, right? So it, it's like small, like small hairs and stuff, right? So they're always um, in, into small bunches. It, it's it's pretty cool. It's a whole different flavor. I love fermented. I love um, spicy food. I love sour food. So it's kind of in my area of how everything is pretty strong. I don't know about everybody else out there, but this is making me very hungry. So there's a lot of preference. There's different cooks of skin cut that are made of a cook of salad, right? But for me, I like to, to cook the skin side down first, and then, uh, then I like to um, flip it over, cook it about halfway, and right before it's done, I flip it back over, and then I add the, uh, the maple and the sage on top, and then it's slowly um, it's going to be liquid back on top. So you can use butter. No, but here I'm just using sunflower oil, which is kind of on the house side. And if I do use butter, I like to use my cherry gold. You know, it's, it's one of the good quality butter that, that you can get if, if you can. Uh, you know, it's pretty good. So we'll take the offer. All right, what's the buffer? I'll give it about less than a minute, about 45 seconds. By that time, it'll be halfway done, and we'll flip that over, and we'll start basting it with the uh, maple and the um, and the sage. And then once I'm done with that, I'm gonna let it rest, and then we're gonna move on and um and make the vinaigrette really quick. But everything else I have prepared and ready to go. So if you have any other questions, just feel free. Sure. If anybody has any questions, please put them in the comments, and I'll be more than happy to ask. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but um, also sunflowers are a common indigenous ingredient, especially um, in California. We grew up with a lot of them. So that from a cocktail perspective is something that I've actually used a lot for doing orjat. Yeah. Our sound is just about done. So I'm going to flip it over. And before I do that, I have my... Um, Prairie sage, I have paprika, and um, and um, onion powder, right? So I'm just gonna pour the um the, the maple syrup in here. I'm gonna mix that up. For me, I, I don't like the um the liquid too too runny. Give me one second. I like to to have it for flavor. So it'll be like it'll be um the liquid be a, a bit muddy, right? And that's okay because I don't want it too watery. No, I, I want most of the liquid and the and the um the seasoning to stay on the um on the salmon. You know, once I start basting the um the um the grease on there, yeah, so it's pretty good. No, you can keep this in your fridge up to seven days. You no, know, it's pretty good. Uh, I like on the summer too. You can mix it with um with some olive oil, whatever it may be. grab my charger really quick. So could you talk everybody through what you're doing? Yeah. So like I was saying with salmon, you know, for me, 
you know, you can sear it and then toss it in the um, in the oven. You know, which is good is the way to do. But for me, uh, I like to keep an eye on, on the um, on the salmon that I'm cooking because you know, I don't want to overcook it. You know, I don't want to burn it, especially if it has um, uh, maple and um, and sage in it, right? So I kind of like to keep an eye on it at all times, just so I know. Done. All right, perfect timing. All right, so now, now I'm gonna I turned off the um and the, the, the um salmon is done. I'm gonna let it sit for a minute in that pan. And then and I'm, I'm gonna take it out and let it rest. So for the next couple minutes, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna work on the um I'm gonna work on the um the, the dressing here. So all I need is um just the the white part, the leeks or green onions. I just need the white part, you know. And um, if you have, you know, during season time for um for wild wild onion and ramps, definitely recommend that. Oh, so I'm I am all about, about the ramps. Yeah. And then um, just a personal question: as somebody that's married to a Hungarian paprika enthusiast. Do you prefer the Spanish or the Hungarian for your cooking? Say that again. Uh, which paprika do you like, the Spanish style or the Hungarian style? Or for what? For just in general, I know there's like two. I'm very much team um, Hungarian paprika, but my husband, who's actually Hungarian, he's a big like smoky Spanish style. So that's something <laughs> that I just ask everybody now. I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah, uh, I would say Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is a thing. <laughs> All right, so just about done here. This is the last place yeah. completely in here. All right. So now I have um, green onions, uh, apple cider. And the second, then the um, so far, all of them will be dropped with maple that I have here. So now, that's pretty much it. They'll be on the sweet side, but they'll get the, the aftertaste of like a lemongrass type of flavor from the uh, sweet grass. Right? So that's all I need in here. It's just um, oil. Um, Sunflower oil, green onions, some some garden powder, and um and maple syrup. And at the end, we're gonna add the um sweet grass. Let me check for you. That's good. All right, give me one minute. Let me run this really quick, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna light up the sweet grass and they can smoke it. One second. I think that um. I don't even know how to explain it, but I think the smell of sweet grass is probably like one of my favorite scents in the whole world. All right, so now it's just the, the liquid of um, the, the vinaigrette here. So now I'm gonna add the, um, I'm gonna like the uh, sweet grass. Yeah, you guys can see it here. How would you describe um, what sweet grass smells like? For me, it just smells like sweet grass. I can't explain it any other way. Um, or like home. Yeah, I would say it's kind of hard to describe too. Um, I would say the smell that's close is I would say the smell is as close as um. You know, if, if we're doing the um the citrus and you're peeling the um the lemon or lime, right? And they take it off the outer layer, you know, and um and, and you get that smell, right? That that fresh citrus. To me, that kind of reminds me of sweet grass. And also if we have a fresh lemon grass and what once you break that open, right, and you get that that smell, to me it's very similar to lemon grass as well. Try this one more time. I have a smoking gun as well, but I kind of like the really stuck old school. So 
don't know if you guys will see that, but it's getting kind of smoky inside of that. I'm just going to move the uh, liquid around just to kind of get some of that smoke in there. Now I'll grab a, a plate that we can start plating the ingredients right here. Let me strain this out really quick. Is this uh, one of the recipes that you feature on your website or on YouTube? I'll ask again when he comes back. I actually can't wait to see what this looks like. So this is how it turned out. It's, uh, it's nice and uh, it's a brown liquid. No, it's it's a nice um, and maple um, vinaigrette, but then you have that smell of the sweetgrass too. So and the apple cider vinaigrette, I love stuff that are kind of funky like that. So to me, you know, just making a quick vinaigrette at home is it, kind of my my way of making um, salad and stuff like that. So let me grab the salmon real quick. Okay. I asked um, where we can find this recipe. Do you have it online? Um, yeah, I can definitely share the recipe with you guys. Sure. And I have a similar recipe on my YouTube channel. But, but this one is different than... Um, no, okay, I can definitely share the uh, recipe. So the dressing is done, the salmon is done, and it's a little charred on the outside. And that's the reason for that is because of the, um, the maple syrup, right? So it, it gives it a, a nice crust on the outside. All right. So my mom will probably say, no, oh, you, you, you burned that food, right? No, but it has a crust to it, a nice char. <laughs> um, okay. So to start off with the salad, I'm going to cut out some of the, um, some of the, um, the cucumbers. I'm just going to cut them in, in really small, thin strips here. Now you can be creative with the, with the salad. You know, you can definitely cut them into like ribbons. You know, it can be fancy, like you're doing fine dining. You know, or you can just keep it like a you know, traditional salad and just cut them into small, into small, um, thin slices, right? So that's what I'm going to do. You can kind of see through them, right? So it gives them more of a, a texture as well. Now, you can definitely take the skin off, right? But I kind of like keeping the skin on. Same thing potatoes have more more value to it. So, but we always eat with our eyes too, right? So we're going to try and make this plate look look um, delicious and look um, creative. So I have cut the... Um, Cucumbers here, and I'm going to cut the uh, some of the green onions and strips just to give it some um, some flavor as well. Not too much. I'm going to cut this into um. So what I usually do with green onions, you know, it's one of the fu fundamentals of cooking, right? When you're doing green onions, you know, you cut that into like a whole a slab, right? You cut the middle down, then you put this face down, and you cut it into slices, right? And then you toss them into um, a cup of cold water, then they start to throw up. Right? You see a lot of that in fine dining restaurants where you have like um, garnishes on top of um, meals, right? And you have these curled up green onions. Basically, that's all you would do. The ice water, have it curl up. Just to give it some, um, some texture and then some flavor as well. All right, so this one is done. I'm going to put this in water here. In the next couple of seconds, it'll start to curl up. Second. I know I'm not the only one that's totally excited to be able to look up this recipe and make it at home. I saw a lot of you uh, with your hungry comments. Now I have the onions here in the water. Cold water, so they're, they're going to start to curl up. It's pretty cool. <laughs> right, so now I have the, um, most of the meat and flour, sorry, ready to go. And the plate I'm going to use is a plate from a friend of mine named Ben Spears. So he, he creates his own um um wooden place and that's his like um style right there. Right. So um it has turquoise in it. You no, know, me being Navajo, it gotta have some turquoise in that. Um 
he first started working doing uh, traditional wooden lacrosse sticks. And then he started getting into uh, making plates and bowls and utensils. And so it's pretty cool. I'm pretty like that, you know, especially here in the Twin Cities. All right, so what I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to um, combine the, um, the greens here. With the um, with the wild rice and the quinoa, right? Just not not too much, just a small amount. And the um, the pomegranate here. I'm gonna add the berries at the end because I don't want to. I don't want my berries mushy while I'm mixing the salad. Right, real I'm it's definitely going to have to hit you up for that plate, though. Yeah, so it's just the pomegranate, the wild rice, and the quinoa, and the greens. Right? That's all I have here right now. And now I'm going to add the, um, the blueberries. Right? So now I'm going to slowly mix that up. So basically, it's the, uh, the mixed watercress, spinach, uh, arugula, blueberries, pomegranate, and um, wild rice and quinoa. Right, so that's kind of like the base of the uh, salad. But now it's just um, learning, learning how, how to build that up. Right, so uh, since I've been wiping, though, if you don't have the um, the um, um, gloves or anything, you know, you always have a, a rag next to you to wipe your hand. You know, that way, if someone questions you that you know you're using your bare hands, especially during the pandemic, right? So, and I don't have a mask on too because this dish will be for me. You know, I'm not serving the community or anyone else. And salad, they, um, I'm gonna put the cucumbers here, just on the side like that. I, I want to show every part of the ingredient as much as I can. Right, because again, you know, just like kids, you know, we eat with the eyes first, then we end up smelling, you know, what type of food it is. Right. Um, let's see. I was putting the cucumber down, then I would put the um, the um, the salmon right on top of the cucumber. That way, you, you can pick up some of the flavor from from the uh, salmon. I have the last thing I have to add is um besides the green onions I have um goat cheese so just working with dairy right um I support a lot of um um, um allies a lot of organic farms and also um, there are a couple of Navajo um sheep herders who are starting to get into um doing goat cheese and and, and dairy product which is pretty cool also and especially a lot of um, tribal beef farms out there too especially in the Navajo Nation. And so we're, we're going to be supporting a lot of those when we open back up as a as a cafe too. Um, right, so I'm just putting some um, cheese on top that kind of cuts the flavor from the acidity of the um, of, of the um, dressing. So now the dressing. You can definitely um, um, mix a salad with the dressing in the beginning, but to me, I like to add it at the end because your greens end up getting soggy and real soon, right? When you have it sit there for a while, so I kind of like to add the dressing on top. So, put some on the cucumber here. So, I mean, it's it's a simple meal, but at the same time. There's a lot of flavor components to it, right? Every bite, every everything that you eat will have its own flavor. So, so it's pretty cool. Let's see. All right. So now the onions. That's just something put on top just to give it some presentation. Right. And I'll show you here in a minute. Like I said, the liquid from the salmon, the grease. I'll be going down, you know, and then the, uh, the, the, the cucumber ends up picking up that liquid and that flavor. Let's see if I can bring this up closer now. You guys can see that. 
That is absolutely gorgeous. And yeah, so it's, it's a nice, healthy, like a, a nice basic meal, right? But then when you're on the line, it's a different story because you have to keep pushing the ingredients out and plates out, right? So which is why the knees are for a lot of cooks. Everything has to be ready and ready to go, right? The only thing you probably fight your own is just the salmon, right? And then sometimes they have pre-cooked salmon as well, but then when you reheat it, it gets kind of dried out. So for me, it's best to cook the salmon from, from it being raw. You know? So again, so we have the salad here. It has... um. Arugula, um, spinach, um, watercress, and the fresh blueberries, pomegranate, and um, the, the fresh goat cheese on top. And then it has wild rice and quinoa as well. And then the maple the maple and sweet grass vinaigrette on top. And then the cucumbers are just at the bottom to help pick up some of the liquid from the salmon. You know, then at the end, you get that nice that nice flavor with the salmon and the cucumber, right? And um, then you have the, the, the charred salmon on top. You know, it's a it's nice um, crust with the but the prairie sage and um and maple syrup. So just stuff like this is something that we can serve here at the cafe and also to our elders as well. Well, thank you so much for taking us through that and making everybody a hundred times hungry. That's a beautiful dish. And thank you so much for your time today. I learned so much and I had a great conversation. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to share, you know, my my narrative, like I said, you know, you guys had um, Sean, one of my mentors, on the week before, you know, and he definitely touches base on decolonizing the health of community, right? And then, then from him, you know, we always have a debate and conversations, right, of how we can meet halfway, right? We just live about our our establishments are about half a mile from each other here in downtown Minneapolis, right? And we also have different perspectives, but at the same time, end of the day, we're on the same goal and the same mission: is the betterment of our community from different perspectives, right? So, yeah, definitely. I can't wait to come over and try both restaurants. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chef Yazzie. It was amazing. Chalky led beautifully. I learned so much about indigenous ingredients and tribal communities. Um, that also looks delicious. I'm super hungry. I'm going to go get some <laughs> food and try to find something along these lines out here in New York right now. Uh, just thank both of our, our panelists and hosts again. Uh, thank you to Portland Cocktail Week. Make sure you follow Portland Cocktail Week. Chucky and Chef Yazzi on all their socials and just a little plug for the Campari Academy and thank you again to Wild Turkey for sponsoring this session today. Uh, if anyone wants to see more sessions like this from Campari specifically, you can go to the Campari Academy portal and follow our Instagram at Campari Academy underscore US. Um, and we'll leave it at that. Another great session for Portland Cocktail Week. So we really appreciate everyone tuning in and have a wonderful day.